Good evening. Welcome to the Internet Kid Safe Show. My name is Ryan Miller. I am the founder of Parent Dome, where I speak to parents and kids about having good digital stewardship and being safe and responsible online. I cover three primary topic areas, which considered uh, awareness, oversight, and controls. Now, this is my debut performance on Computers 2K now, and uh, bear with me as I strive to communicate clearly to you regarding my passion in which that is keeping kids safe on the internet. And this is a very diverse topic and it covers a multitude of areas in a digitally immersed life for children. And I wanted to, to start off the first episode in dealing with what is an epidemic for children that are in schools today. And this epidemic has been referred to as sexting. Uh, this has been very prevalent in the news recently in Colorado. A middle school had uncovered and found that over 200 students had sexual images contained on their phones. So what I would like to do is I wanted to describe a little bit about digital stewardship and smart technology. And I want to grab my, my cell phone device here. In the past, as parents, we had children and there was a term called latch key children where children were left home while their parents would work and they would be typically put in front of a TV and consume media for extended periods of time. And it was a one way form of communication. The child would sit in front of the TV and they would be receiving information through through the media and they would watch programming of various kinds. It could be PBS and Sesame Street and depending upon the age group, it was Barney or Teletubbies, what have you. And it, it wasn't an interactive experience. Well, as technology changed, the media became much more interactive. With the advent of personal computers, it would be an interaction that would be textual based. And you could text on your keyboard and communicate with multiple people through what was called internet relay chat or online texting. Well, today, interactivity has gotten much more in depth and in detail and that we can have communications like I am having with you right now with a video communication. And that video communication can also be recorded for posterity or for um, review at a later time. So today, there's a technology that is ubiquitous, and that is the smartphone. It is often referred to as the pocket boogeyman. And this is a device which is completely interactive that you can video, you can photo, you can text, and you have access to the power and the depth of the internet, unlike we have ever had before. This is a leap in technology. And there are some statistics out there as to the amount of number of smartphone devices in circulation today. And it actually eclipses the entire population of the globe. There are more cellular devices with digital connections than there are people on the planet. That's a staggering number when you think about it. So as I go through my broadcast and I talk on some of these issues, I, I welcome people to call in at 919-518-9773, or you can communicate via Skype on Computers 2K Voice. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you may have or contribute to, to the conversation. So this pocket boogeyman, which I refer to, is a way for us to have instant access to any type of information we want at any time. And as adults, we have kind of inherent wisdom based upon how we've been brought up on appropriate use on how to, to use this device. Now, children, depending upon if they've been given access to this uh, technology, may have more knowledge on the device than we do but they don't necessarily have the wisdom on the appropriate use of it. So one important thing that I want to point out relative to being connected to the internet is the permanence of the internet. Whatever we do, say, share, record, 
email, search, has a permanent record associated with it. Our thoughts of hitting a delete key, if it has gone through the internet, the assumption of that being gone is improper because there are data archives through Google and Bing and Yahoo, through your internet service providers, in, ad in addition to the actual applications that you may be using to transmit that information. And in some cases, the, 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 the manufacturers of the devices, such as Samsung or Apple or Motorola, also have a copy of that data. And then if you were to read uh, what Edward Snowden had reported about that the government also has access and a record of all of that information. So that's a very important thing to note because what happens with what we do with this digital communication and how we use it, there is a record of it. One thing I want to, uh, another thing I want to mention is that the technology itself is not dangerous. These are tools, hardware, software, applications, these tools are to help us in productivity, to help us in managing our entertainment, uh, to, to be entertained through, through gaming applications. And kids really take advantage of the entertainment value or the social media experience of being connected to the internet. But unfortunately, because it is interactive, what a person or a child may do on the internet may not be considered dangerous but what someone may do on the other side interacting with them could be very dangerous. So I wanna kind of poke the conscience a little bit to determine our own participation on the internet and how we manage our own personal communication on the internet through social media platforms and um, other means of communication through the internet. If that is a behavior that we would expect our children to model, would they deviate from our own behavior or would they go beyond our behavior? So this is a little exercise. I, I also do um, broadcasts on Periscope and I also participate on some other social media platforms where I ask these kind of questions in reflection to have people get a framework of understanding as to, is the internet dangerous? I've reported previously that on uh, CNN there was an episode called Being 13 that Anderson Cooper and the CNN crew did a series of um, surveys and it was reported through CNN that 94% of parents believe their kids are safe on the internet. And that is contrary to the information that I have found and the research that I have gathered that safety on the internet must have a different definition because when I go through this exercise, um, I think this may bring some clarity to it. So not sure the age group of people that may, may be, be uh, viewing this cast, but if we were to look at our own social media experience, uh, Facebook or other social platforms that we interact with people what, without, without regard to frequency, there are, I say, three topic areas which people adults communicate and I'll, I'll start with men. Um, men have one topic area which they can be very passionate about and have a lot of statistical information in their head and we'll call that sports. That many men have their favorite sports franchise and they know the quarterbacks and they know the, their centers and they know the goalies. They, they know these statistics in and out and they're very passionate about their team that they're, um, they rally behind. And when they get into a social media experience, rooting for their team or posting information about their team, someone that is a rival team may come in and offer some unintentional barbs to create a little, I don't know, conflict. And then all of a sudden this conversation between a couple of people starts to percolate and bubble. And then the, the language and the intensity heightens. Now that's not across the board, but that's just kind of a reference point that this is something that, that happens with, with men. Let's take it up to a, another level. If we are coming from divergent political positions, regardless of which side of the spectrum or the aisle you sit in your political views, that 
when a political conversation happens in a social media platform, they can get very animated, vitriolic, and they can be very attacking. Now, whether you, depending upon how you participate, this is a, a self-reflection examination, you can determine how you are contributing to that conversation. And as if your child were to see that behavior, is that a behavior which they would model? So let me take you up to the third level, which is really good to demonstrate that this may not be where you participate, but I'm asking you, have you seen this behavior? Your own keys and what you participate or what others may be responding to you in what is happening? Because I'm talking about the interactive experience of being on the internet. So when we get to the third level of my example, I talk about religion. Again, without regard to what, what your uh, theological views are or, or non-theological views, those topic areas seem to bring the highest level of vitriolic conversation. And again, which side would you sit on that computer? Would you be de-escalating, escalating? Is it getting very animated? Well, let's take that mind and take it down to a 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old, that as adults, we know when things can be getting out of control and we can handle it with the experience and the, and the maturity of an adult. But as a child, they don't have that wisdom, and some of those comments to them can be quite injurious. So I wanted to give you that kind of context as a, a framework for this interactivity and, and how, how it affects us in our own experience as we look at the lens and what we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about in sexting with children. So when I, when I use the word sexting, that, that has a, a meaning behind it. And the meaning is it is an actual image, a physical photographic and or video based image that is sexually related. It's sexual in nature, it's revealing, it's inappropriate and Depending upon which state you reside, the laws regarding that legality or illegality of it is determined in the appropriateness of that photo. So I am not going to, I am not an, a lawyer, so I will not be espousing legal advice, but I will say that when you cross the, cross the line of legality in the state you reside, we have, there's a big problem occurs and it's a, it's a ripple problem. But aside the, from the legal implications, those images are back to what I said earlier, are permanent. Whatever happens on that device that is transmitted through the internet is permanent. So a behavior that children, many kids have, is that they are constantly connected to this smartphone device. And they're, they're very crafty, they're very tricky, and again, they have a lot of knowledge on how to use it, that is many times outpaced that of the parents. So I'm gonna talk about one of their sneaky tricks that they have done that um, parents are not aware of, and this was an exploit that happened in Colorado. Uh, I reside in Pennsylvania. It was recently in the news in, in our state about 10 days ago. Um, so what they do is they have this phone, and let's take it not in the domain of sexting, but they're taking pictures. So it's not unusual for a child to be walking through school with the device and they appear that they are interacting on their device and they walk by a teacher's desk and they look like they're interacting on the phone, but they do a quick photo of the teacher's desk in hopes that they may find something that maybe other people would not find that would advantage them in what they're doing in that class. I'm not saying everybody, I'm not saying what percentage, but I'm saying this is a behavior that happens in schools principals report about it, that um, they are using this device to do those such of activities. Another activity which the kids are doing in school is they're using live streaming applications on this where they are doing a video communication with a one to many. So I'm sitting here in my home office and I'm communicating to X number of people out on the internet and this is being live recorded. Well, there are tools like Periscope or Meerkat or Spreecast or Blab or what have you. There's multiple of these applications, Skype, Ubu, um, that kids live cast and they're walking through school, they're sitting in a library, they're sitting in a cafeteria, they're sitting in a restroom and they have this live cast going through from their phone out to many people and it's creating a record. And then the other piece is they are taking photos. 
Now, photos is really the thing that is hitting the, the bench, pinging off the charts. Uh, there, there's a whole new word that is very frequent, and uh, mothers can attest to this if they have daughters. This is very heavily popular with, with the female crowd, and um, because of the advent of the Kardashians, it is, it, it's probably a new word in the dictionary. And when I say it, everybody's going to go, I know, I know you, you guys already know what I'm going to say already. It's the selfie. And the statistics show that girls 14 and above are taking 200 to 300 selfie pictures per day. At various times, at various stages, there's, there's a whole genre of the, the getting ready selfie that young girls are taking photos of themselves, getting ready for school, getting ready to go out to an event. This is what they do. And it's not that they are transmitting these 200 to 300 photos, but they're taking this amount of photos and they're filtering and applying them for um, how they want to share with them. So these photos now, selfies or other photos, wind up being shared. So an application which is very well known that is for sharing photos is Instagram. So kids will take a photo, they'll post it up to their Instagram wall, their Instagram followers will like it. Now they start feeling a sense of value on the quality of photo and their, their identity is now or their worth is based upon the likes, comments, and shares based upon this photo, which kind of perpetuates them to take more and more photos and to do more photo editing to increase their, what I, I refer to, an external identity locus. And I'll talk about that in another episode. But this is a, it's what is happening in the culture of young children. And they, they also participate in numerous, countless applications, Ask FM, Snapchat, Kick. Um, wow, you now being very, very popular with kids, Omegle. And I, I, again, I will handle this on another episode because there are so many, I'd say the tentacles go very far and wide and deep. So these photos are constantly accumulating on children's phones and they're sharing among their peer group. And then when they get in other social media applications, people encourage them to do new kinds of photos, different kinds of photos. Like Ask FM is very well known as uh, probably the wor worst applications for a child to have. So let me just take a dovetail. If I have parents listening here and you have child's phone and you have the ability to gain access to that phone and see if they have this particular app on it, ask.fm, my, my first word of advice is have a conversation with your child and look at what's happening on there. And I am strongly believe that you're going to want to remove that application by the end of this episode or, or tomorrow morning, because that, that application is specifically tailored to take ch children down a very, very bad path. It starts off innocent. The first five, six, seven, 10, 12 questions are very innocent. But after that, it gets very dark and deviant and it's, it's a very scary place. And I, I pray your children haven't gotten that far I would say eyes on and look for that application. So that application, among many others, are challenging children to do things that they wouldn't normally do in public and they wouldn't do it with you sitting beside them. They're going to have to retreat into somewhere private to maintain this external identity of locus with this community that they've developed. And these people are gonna challenge them to, hey, what color is your underwear? And the kid answers, it's blue. Well, show me. Then all of a sudden you got a banter back and forth. And that, oh my gosh. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. This is my first episode and I didn't see the chat roll coming in. So I am having questions coming in here and these are very good and I do want to address them. So I, I apologize, Jeff and Susan, I, and I will address your questions and I will ask them and answer them. So... The, these applications are taking these children down a path that they are um, going to be tempted into responding to them. So inevitably at some point, depending upon a child's wisdom and their maturity and their ability to resist this fame based upon some moral compass, that oftentimes the pressure comes with some threat or an intimidation. So 
one question that, that came in here, do teachers get trained to recognize when kids do that? And it's a very, it's a very good question, Jeff, and I, and I want to respond to that. Um, and then I'm going to go back into to the, the sexting. Most schools in the United States send home with parents an entire assortment of documents that need to be signed. And there's from health forms, through code of conduct, through disciplinary action, and mixed in those list of documents is, and it goes by different names depending upon which school you go to, but a, a per permitted use document, appropriate use of technology document. And this is what I would call the waiver of indemnica indemnification of the school, along with outlining the school's policies with external and internal network connected devices. So, Let's say the school has a policy to maintain security for their own digital assets, the laptops, the computers, the Promethean boards. Those are the school's digital assets and they have them secured. They have them blocked off as much as the school knows how to from bad internet searches or bad data transfer. So they have control of their digital assets. But the phones and the laptops that come into the school are not the property of the school. In actuality, they're not even the property of the children. They're the property of the parents. And that there's a very important distinction that I need to make here is that those devices that parents put in the child's hands are the legal contractual property of the parents. And it's important to note that because what is ever on that device that is in your child's hands is a contractual agreement that you have clicked the I agree box with your cellular carrier and the applications. And this, I don't want to sound this to be a fear monger. That's not my objective here. I'm trying to speak about awareness and to tell you that this is a, a very broad issue. And that's why I'm very passionate about it. Um, I've seen a lot of harm because people are not aware of some of the things I'm talking about. So. I, I went off track there for a moment. So <clears throat> the digital assets in which the parents put in the child's hands to come to school, that permitted use document is, it sets the policies for how the school will manage how your child will use that device in school. So an example will say that children shall not be permitted to use phones during school hours. That could be an example of a, a, a criteria set by the school. Now, the enforceability of that is that if they are caught with the device, they may say, warning one, the phone will be taken away from you for the day and it will be returned to you at the end of the day. Second infraction, it will be taken away from you for a week and it will be returned to you in a week. Third infraction, we will take it until the end of the year. Now. I don't know your particular documents that you may have signed as to what you agreed to when you signed that. I know what I, I had agreed to when I read my agreement and I chose not to sign it in its form that I modified it and sent it back to school and said, this is the way we will deal with it with our family. And I have no concern about my daughter using her phone during school because during school hours, the device is shut off when she gets off the bus and it turns back on when she gets on the bus. So this, the hours in school, I have no risk with my daughter because the device is inoperable. Um, so the enforcement of it within the school is subjective to each of the teachers desires to whether they want to enforce it or not and the principal's relationship with the teachers. And in my daughter's school example is that they do not enforce that the kids not use their phones in school, that they provide them time to access their calculator to use it in class or during a break they can get on Snapchat or Quick Kick or Instagram or do something. That's The teachers feel that that is a reward system for their kids to give them access to it. But the school has no legal responsibility to manage what that child is doing on the phone. That's more of a parental responsibility because that's not a school's technology, it's a parental technology. So that, I went, that, that took me down a, a little rabbit hole, but it was an important point to make. Uh, I did want to, to reiterate that if you did have questions, uh, you can call into 919-518-9773, or you can communicate via Skype, via computers, 
2K voice. So I mentioned that there's this uh, phenomenon of this continuous capturing of photos. I refer, refer to the selfies and that they share them through the social media platforms and the social media platforms can take the kids into a domain that is based upon threat and or intimidation or bullying to show more in a photo than a child may necessarily want to volunteer in a photo. So now we get into where uh, Susan said, she made a comment when I was talking about this, that kids can pull the wool over our eyes when it comes to technology. And that's a very true statement because as I said earlier, the kids, many kids have a greater new understanding of technology than the parents do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one out at you, which is a little scary. Um, it's, a, it's an application or a type of application that has very positive business applications. It's actually a, def a function on the de uh, Android devices default. Um, but there's these applications which are called vault applications. They're free downloads from the Google Play Store and from uh, iOS from Android. And they get downloaded by a child, free, get installed on the phone, and they look very innocent. One of them actually looks almost identical to the calculator function on the iOS. But what this vault application is, if you were to click on it and open it, it would function like a normal calculator, like, oh, look at this cool calculator. But it's actually got a password protection. So if you put a, a decimal point with a, a security code, it opens you up into this folder repository which is where anything that you don't want to be seen that is password protected gets hidden in this folder. So what happens is the kids are nervous about certain images not getting visible by not being visible by their parents. They stick them in this vault application. So they may have taken a photo on their phone and before it goes on Instagram, they're not gonna put it up on Instagram because maybe their parents are following them on Instagram. But you know what, they're, they don't see what I'm doing on you now or they don't see what I'm doing on Kick or oh, by the way, Snapchat, it disappears. So it's not really there. Well, as I said, the internet is permanent. It doesn't disappear. It, it's still out there. People will take a screenshot of that image and send it all over the place. So what they do is they take these photos that they're a little nervous about that they don't want mom and dad to see and they tuck them into this vault app and they think they've hidden it away and it's secure. Well, this is what happened in Colorado. This is what happened in Pennsylvania that some kids didn't have the vault apps. Many kids did have the vault apps and under a order of a subpoena, they were, comp they were getting phones and they had an abundance of children in possession of what was identified as child pornography in each of those states. So it, it met the definition of child pornography in the state of Cal Colorado. It met the definition of child pornography in Pennsylvania. A portion of them were tucked away in the vault apps. Another portion were still out in the public domain that the kids thought they deleted, but they were still accessible and they were still being distributed through social media applications. Here's where the danger, here's where the scary part really gets is that those images now, that, that, that was a felony crime. That, that's a felony to be in possession and distribution and transmission of pornographic material. This is something that, again, I'm not an attorney you can verify with your own state as to what the laws are regarding what constitutes child porn. And we're dealing with minors because these are all kids in school that are under the age of 18. But the other, remember I mentioned earlier that this device is not the property of the children, it's the property of the parents. So there's a legal reach back because you can't have a contract with the child. That's against the law. But the parents have a contract and it goes back to the parents. Now understand that, that the law doesn't want to prosecute these kids that are in pain because of having made a mistake. But at the same time, they have an obligation to enforce the law. And for me, this comes, this come, happens to me a lot that I have based upon my communications, I have people coming to me, what do I do now? 
and because the photos are already there, they're already out in the public domain, and the parents are like, oh my gosh, the school confiscated my child's phone, what do I do now? And my whole message and my passion is to draw awareness, to have the oversight, to establish the controls in advance of what do I do now? The what do I do now is, I, this is what I say, this is part of my, my cliche communication is that the toothpaste has been squeezed out of the tube and I've got this mess of sexting images that are out there. My first response, what do you do now, is you have to call an attorney. This is, this is a legal issue at this point, and we didn't stop it in advance. Now we have to get the law involved, and your best defense is get that attorney. Shut your mouth and get an attorney because you don't want to incriminate yourself, and you want to protect your child because something snuck by you, and something went by your visibility and oversight and controls that you had in your home that you were hoping your kid was going to be safe but there wasn't some of these things in place to ensure they were going to be safe. Again, please understand this is not a judgmental thing. This is a very difficult message for me to share. And it's, it's right in the core of my being. So this is, I'm talking to a broad group of people. Um, so I want to help people on the proactive side to develop the tools, skills, and resources as it relates to their family dynamic as it relates to the relationship and the intellectual and emotional development of their children, their responsibility, and do measured and appropriate access to information over time. That with, with giving them access to something so powerful and so dangerous without the tools and the, the wisdom on how it can be used can damage them forever. It can affect their ability to get into college, can affect them to get into uh, a job. So we'll go back into this, this texting, sexting uh, situation is that the kids are taking the photos, they're sharing them out in the public domain. There's a record, a permanent record of those and trying to get those back and scrub them back is a, a costly and time staking effort and that they're hidden in their phones. So what I'm referring to right now is an epidemic. It is, I've been to countless schools, I've met with countless principals, lawyers, police, school counselors, and this is something that is happening every day in the school. And what is replacing sexting? Sexting is happening in catastrophic percentages. And um, most of the people say, it's not my kid. And I, I can appreciate that that statement. It's not my kid. They wouldn't do that. And I and I my response to that is if you don't see it and you don't verify it and you just heard of a vault application just tonight, this is the first time you've heard of it. I'm saying, how do you know it's not your kid? Because I'm not saying your kid is offering to do that. I'm not. I'm saying that there are some pretty nasty people out there on the internet that are predators or that are bullies, or that are manipulators. And most of the times these people are grown-ups and they know how to t use the words to cultivate kids down a path. And they use threat and intimidation to do that. And or guilt, they use guilt as well. So that communication that's coming in from the other side is pulling your child. And it's there's, there's documented studies on the behavior of sexual predators or deviant predators but they don't just go after one and they it, the term they used in in the the field is that they are grooming sexual predators groom they're a whole bunch of people at the same time and they're all trying to move them closer and closer to an event that they want them to get to the what the what the predators objectives are they're trying to get them to that final event but they're grooming a whole bunch of them and they're pulling them down this path and it and believe it or not, it happens as young as on Webkins, on Magic Penguin, and other other means of interactive communication. And I I just um, so there was a, a question that that came in relative to what is an appropriate age to give a phone to a child, and uh, and that's a very good question. And I would say that today 
not having access to a phone is it can be a bit challenging for like middle school and 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 kids in high school because if you don't you're <laughs> you're going to be embarrassed because everybody's got them but giving them access to the phone i think is an important thing and when i say the phone that's that's the dial tone that's the voice communication on both sides of the path and the next thing would be would i want them to have access to texting what what age would be appropriate for texting? So a phone, you can make any decision as to what an appropriate age is to have access to a phone because if, when we were attached with an umbilical cord, grandma and, and grandson could talk on that umbilical cord. Putting a, a just a phone dial tone connection with a young child, I don't see that as being a tremendous risk. But when that phone has the ability to text, I would say that's another age barrier, that another age threshold age, emotional, intellectually dependent. And then the other features of the phone, I would say, holy smokes, I would not just put that in my kids' hands. I would want to say that this is, this is my device. This is mine. I pay for it. It's expensive. It's a $500 piece of technology. I will allow you to use it but these are the conditions in which you are allowed to borrow my device and set up a, a relationship with your child that's not based upon their entitlement, their, their need to have this device. It's a gift. It's something that you're bestowing upon them based upon them doing certain things. And in, in my, um, and what I do for my business is I have this curriculum that talks about these kind of things and how to establish a contract relationship with your child relative to that device and appropriate use with that device. Um, so I, I did want to come in for a moment and say, by the way, if you wanted to ask questions, I have another one coming in here. You can dial into 919-518-9773 or Computers 2K Voice, and that's via Skype. And uh, again, my name is Ryan Miller from Parent Dome, and this is my debut. Um, I have not done this before. So any information that, that people would like me to specifically address on how to keep kids safe on the internet, I'd be willing to take that and uh, prepare that for the next show. Um, Susan asked, I would love to see carriers conduct classes to educate parents to these dangers. Susan, my gosh, that, that is a beautiful request. And I would too. Um, I've met with the carriers and, and you would know, here's the crazy thing in my interviews, when I had them with Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, Cricket, Walmart, all of the carriers and the contracts that they offer, the, the cellular carriers have available to parents, parental controls on the contract. And I asked them what percentage of parents when signing up for a plan talk about or investigate or inquire about parental controls on the device. And the entire store looks at me like I had, like a dog when he hears a weird noise and they turn their head. He's like, what are you talking about? The only thing people are talking about is what the newest technology is and how cool would it be to upgrade to this new device and can we afford this plan to get this device? And oh, by the way, we're gonna hand this old device down into our family in the family plan, and we're just gonna bump the upgrade path up to the parents and never, and it dovetails down to the, the kids. So in the area of the carriers, the parents want, aren't, most of the parents aren't asking the questions about parental controls, and honestly, if we look at it from a, a Machiavellian approach as to what is the carrier's objective, the carrier's objective is not to protect how you use that or regulate or restrict. We are data access points. Every keystroke that we do on a phone, every image that we send, every Google search that we make is a data, we're providing data to these entities that they can market additional things to us. They sell it, they cross pollinate, that we are just data repositories. So they don't want to have certain level of security known to us. 
They don't want us to know how to turn off location settings. They want to make it difficult for us to turn off location settings because that's not to their best interest. Their best interest is to get as much information from us, from anybody that interacts with that device as possible. So to Susan's point, I would love to see the carriers have that kind of proactive stance and they do to a certain degree in that they have it available online that through your contract you can execute some of these triggers or, or controls at your option. Some are free, some are fee-based, and it is, and I say this is part of the plan that parents have accessible to them in the domain of controls. Remember I talk about awareness, then the oversight, and the controls. This is in the control domain as to what the carriers provide for you. But that's just one level of control. There's multiple levels of controls that we need to take in addition to those. That's my recommendation. Um, so I would appreciate it if the, the cellular companies would do that. But I honestly, I don't believe it's in their best interests. Um, that's, a, that's a great idea. Um, I did, <laughs> it's a, I'm talking to Susan in my mind and she said, what is my website address? And be, before I share that with you, um, I am, I wanted to make a, a self admission here that sometimes I am very close to my subject matter and I'm very passionate about what I do. And my desire is to protect as many kids as I possibly can as soon as I can. Now that doesn't necessarily translate with the way people need to digest information um, because I have built an incredibly powerful resource for parents. And honestly, when I share it with people, it is overwhelming. Um, somebody that I have communicated with me has said, Ryan, you have an actual university's levels worth of content and that scares the living daylights out of people. And that's not what I want to do. I do not want to overwhelm, scare, and say this is a monumental task. That is not my objective. So I, I want to provide information in an appropriate way, and I'm, I'm doing this slowly. So I am going to uh, provide an a email link in just one second, if I can. Um, there is a bit.ly link, and you know what? I don't know the best way to do this, and I will have to, to coordinate with um, the owner of the station on the best way for me to share this information. But for now, uh, my website address to answer Susan is www.parentdome.com. Now, I do have a special offer for, for this audience here, and my marketing material definitely needs work. Um, I, it's not the typical internet marketing type of presence. It is basically a college curriculum of information, and the sales and marketing stuff is, is still being fine-tuned. So by next episode, you will see a different presence of how I do my information. So when you go through that, um, I have information in there that is open for free. So when you go through the lesson area, you can digest some of that information that uh, is for free. And I do have an offer in there for that curriculum, and uh, you will see that represented on the website. And if it is something that you're, you, I would say maybe watch me for a couple of episodes or check, up, check me out on Periscope, or uh, there's another site called catch.me, K-A-T, ch dot m e and i will i'm going to find out another way to communicate this with everyone um that has a, an archive of things that i've been talking out about for the past month on a regular basis about internet security and safety and awareness oversight and controls um so i want to give people information that's staged not staged i should say flowed out in a, a slower format as opposed to being overwhelmed but if you are not overwhelmed by how deep this is, and you understand that my objective is to give you as much information as I can that you can digest at your own pace. That's what the idea is, that I don't want to say you need to consume this all at once. You can take it bit at a time, and if you see something in there that, like an app that is on your child's phone that you weren't aware of, well, that, that resource is there, and I tell you about it. I tell you about the risks, the dangers, and I talk about the child contracts and such. But if, if it is not overwhelming to you, and and the price 
I, I believe I have a very fair value in the price that I have uh, put on this university's worth of material. Um, with relationship with the broadcaster, I have a, a special offer that goes with that that's beyond that's available on the website. So if you were to transact with me on that site, there's a 50% discount off of that, but that's based upon a coupon code. And that coupon code is, it's the name SHAMGAR, S-H-A-M-G-A-R. And you know what, I, I don't know, I'm gonna try this. I'm still trying to figure this out, but I think this is the best way for just this episode. I'm going to write it that way. If you're watching me on the live stream, it's S-H-A-M-G-A-R. That is the coupon code that will be open for this broadcast for that, that information. Um, so I was, I was sharing that the, the sexting is an epidemic, and um, honestly, you don't need to trust my information on that. If you do some Googling on um, Valley Forge Middle School, or I, I forget the name of the school in Colorado, it's very popular in the news because it was a, a very large issue in Colorado. It hit main, mainstream news across the country. And just because it hit the news, doesn't mean that the others it's not happening because as I was mentioning my interviews with the the school officials the superintendents the psychologists the police the legal professionals the police are at schools at the rate of two to three times a week now the circumstances may vary for their their frequency but in in speaking to the officers that I've done up and down the east coast the large preponderance of their calls were related to these sexually related passing of images. And when I mentioned earlier about the toothpaste being out of the tube, this is where the parents are really, really upset. And that, granted, they have every right to be upset, but they're upset at the school. And the school is the wrong place to focus their their frustration because the school doesn't have the authority or the responsibility to manage what someone's child is doing on this. This is the parent's property. It's not the school's property. And that sounds harsh, but I, it doesn't want to be harsh. It's the reality. And that as parents, we have an incumbent responsibility on, on the stewardship and the custodianship of the, the kids that we have. And I suggest that we all, if we are parents of children, have an objective as to what kind of child we want to put out into society. That we have whatever upbringing we have, whatever socialization, education that we have, whatever our family dynamic that relationship is, I would think we all have something in common. And that commonality is if we have a child that we want something better for our child than we had for ourselves. I think that would be a common theme. But we have a short period to do that. We've got 10 to 12 years that we can impact that life, that little child's life, before they're 18 and they can leave on their own. And some of us will prepare them to be able, with, without regard to gender, to be able to change a tire, to cook a meal, to balance a checkbook, to, to deductively reason, to understand logic, some of the things that don't come through the education system, the school doesn't teach a child how to change a tire, and the school doesn't teach them how to iron, may cook a meal here and there, or they don't teach them how to balance a checkbook. But those are some of the things that fall in the domain of our parenting responsibilities, if we choose to accept them. And the other thing is resiliency. We want to foster in resiliency that when they get knocked down, they can get picked back up and they can keep going. They can persevere. They can persevere. We want to give them a sense of hope. So I say that when we are dealing in the age of the digital, this digital age, digitally immersed, connected lives through YouTube, through the smartphone, through video games. Video games are very popular with boys and they're living many hours behind headphones with information going into their heads that parents don't hear. The texting that is, that the images that are coming into them are going into their eyes. And sometimes we don't see the de degree of the violence of those images that is coming into these kids. 
or we choose that we don't want to address it because the conversation would be too hard. So I want to talk on that for a moment because I've, I've gone over many different points. And I want to say, remember, I'm not I'm trying not to sound judgmental to, to this. And sometimes I, I drive a little deep in what I say. And, and that's just part of my passion coming out that I am not a proponent about taking technology away from kids. I'm not at all. I believe that if somebody, after hearing me, were to rip this out of a child's hand, you have got an in incredible conflict that you have just introduced. So let me talk about the conversation for just a moment. I am a proponent of using more words and age-appropriate words that, and I've had to do this myself, and I've had to backstep with my own daughter who is 14, and I go, sweetie, I got to tell you, I just learned about something that I had no clue about. You know I love you. You know I care about you, and I know I, you know I trust you. And you don't give me reasons for not to trust you because of the way we currently manage our technology. But, sweetie, I just found out something that I had no, no idea about. I heard about this application. Is this on your phone? Yeah, Dad, it's on my phone. Oh, okay. Can you show me how it works? Can we sit down and show, show how it works and we can go through it together? So we did this and it just happened with me and it was an application called Musical.ly. Very simple, innocent application, funny application. I still use it today, but it's on my phone, but not on my daughter's phone. Because when I watched it with my daughter, it's a lip syncing application. Popular songs, popular movie titles, one, two sentences, the kids, do their own action with somebody else's voice behind it. It's hysterical, but it's, it's like Vine. You scroll through, you see the next one. You scroll through, you see the next one. But within a series of 10 videos, I saw a couple of kids, these mostly young kids, mostly 15 and under. Some of them were very, very funny. Some of them started going in a direction which made me uncomfortable, that there were girls starting to be dressed inappropriately. Then there were boys starting to dress inappropriately. And then I saw one that my daughter said, Dad, I had no idea. And I said, I had no idea either, honey. Is this something that we should have on your phone? And she said, no, Dad, I, I don't need that. I said, great. I really appreciate that. So we can do it together that I think it's funny. So I have two apps on my own phone, Musical.ly and Dub Smash, that are that funny application. And we do them together. And we, she does them and I videotape them and I do them and she videotapes me and we do them together and it's hysterical. It's a fun tool, it's a, it's a game. But if I had her doing it on her own and people commenting on it and she's in her bedroom outside my visibility, she may be recording something that she didn't want to record and she could get herself trapped. So, um, I'm about having the conversation. I'm not about yanking it away. In that example, my daughter already had the application on her phone. And I'm a, this is my business. I want to keep her secure and safe and once snuck right by me. And because I don't lock her phone totally down, but I have eyes on the phone. And this one came in that day. So I want to say this is not to scare you. I want to empower you. I want to. Uh, let you know that the journey to understand how technology, your kids may have more knowledge about technology than you do, doesn't need to be the case. That I can be a partner with you to make it an easy journey, that you can make your own decisions as to how you want to interact with your children to keep them safe, and to put in the appropriate controls if or if not they're needed. Because honestly, if you have the oversight, the controls may not be necessary. But the, the very the underlying thing here that is very important to know is that a conversation alone is not sufficient. And let's, let's do this in an, another self-reflective moment. As children, when we were growing up, our parents had conversations with us all the time. Don't do this. Don't do that. And if we were to be honest in this question right now, did we lie to them? I won't look, expect you, but I'll answer for myself. Yeah, I lied to my parents. I, I made poor choices. I did things that I got cut, I got bruised, I got broken bones. I healed. 
I broke the law. I got punished. But right now, that was just based upon the conversation and I transgressed on the conversation. When my parents had eyes on me, my ability to transgress diminished. But with the age of the internet, the conversation alone and the lie and what can happen with the permanence of it, that broken bone is a permanent broken bone. It doesn't get healed because it travels through with them perpetually. That image goes forever. The kids that are at college that are taking photos and posting them on Facebook of the upside down keg stands are preventing them from getting a job at GE. Them toking on marijuana on a hookah in college and wanting to pl apply for a job as a law professional 10 years from now voids that opportunity. So this, this permanence is what I'm trying to speak to and how the conversation is not enough. It's a, it's, a, it's a starting point, but the conversation in combination with the oversight and the establishment of controls is a huge triumvirate in order to help keep your child safe. And I, I don't mean restraint, I don't. I mean for them to be safe because our awareness of those evils out there is one thing, but our awareness on how to see those evils and how to protect against those evils is a very important thing. So uh, this was my first episode and I, I went around a little bit and I'm going to try to um, frame my message as best I can. And um, I welcome feedback on, the, on my website at parentdome.com. Uh, you can contact me through email. And any questions, um, I'm free to answer. I encourage you to check me out on Periscope. Uh, my, my Periscope handle is parent underscore dome. And um, I hope you heard my passion come through clearly because I really want to keep your kids safe. And I want to help you to have the tools in order to achieve that in the most practical way. And again, based upon your own family dynamic, because I know they're all diverse. So I'm not sitting up in some ivory tower looking down because I'm not. I've got my own family dynamic. So um, I look forward to, to participating on Computers 2K Voice and uh, future broadcasts. And I, I ask you if you have other people that are interested in child security to, to invite them to the show. So uh, thank you very much. Have a great night. And I hope you all have an enjoyable weekend. Thanks. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam, with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet, with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.